Thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar on Shift No Drift Towards Active Demand Response and Beyond. So, first of all, I would like to say a few words about why this topic. Actually, the widespread attention that demand response have received is very much related to the flexibility challenge. Before, the power system was operated in a node following mode, meaning that most of the flexibility is provided by the generation side, which is dominated by centralized, predictable, and dispatchable power plants. However, nowadays, with more and more renewables, we see that generation mix is becoming more decentralized, less predictable, and less dispatchable. In this case, less flexibility can be provided by the generation. Therefore, demand is expected to provide more flexibility, and that is why we need active demand response. The importance of demand response has been already recognized by various EU policies, and its value has also been searched in many literatures. However, in reality, we found there is significant skepticism about consumer engagement. Some people argue that the financial incentives are too small for consumers to react. And other people claim that consumers, they don't like complexity. And we can also see such intimidating slogan like Big Brother to switch off your fridge. So if these sayings are true, then there is no future for demand response. Why bother to talk about it at all nowadays? Well, we think that we couldn't accept this argument without rigorous um, analysis. So what we do in the THINK um, report is that we challenge this view by adopting a consumer-centered approach. So before claiming that consumers could be active or could, couldn't be active, we need to assess systematically the consumer's potential and willingness to participate in active demand response. And then the next question is what we need to do in order to realize the active demand response. And third question is what is beyond? And this question I'm going to discover with you together towards the end of this webinar. So before we enter in, uh, into the first part, let me say that this webinar is based on the THINK report on shift not drift towards active demand response and beyond. So THINK is a European funded project hosted by Florence School of Regulation. And my colleague and I, we produce two reports every six months to advise the European Commission on diverse energy policy issues. So this semester we have just published um, our report on the 11th think report on this topic of demand response. So here is the link where you can find our five page of policy brief and 40 page of um, the report with the replies we received from public consultation attached as annex. Okay, so now let's enter into the part one, how to assess consumers' potential and willingness to participate in active demand response. Actually, these two aspects are essential to engage consumers. It is not only enough to, to know whether consumer is able to participate in demand response, and we also need to know whether he is willing to do so. And next step is the next question that we have asked ourselves during our research is that after knowing this potential willingness, how to make these two aspects actually be materialized in the reality? Then we found the contract is in fact a missing piece of the puzzle and is very much under-searched in the current literature. However, the contract terms such as the money, the capacity, as well as the timing can influence or be influenced by consumers' potential and the willingness. That is why we have adopted an analytical approach which is consumer-centered and we have a focus on contract. So now um, I would like to launch the first poll um, to, on how you estimate your potential to participate in demand response. Here we go. I hope that you have already seen the poll on your screen now. So there are several options. Let me guide you through them. 
So the first option says that you think you can still react with dumb appliances and you don't necessarily need a smart meter. And the second option says that you can you think it's possible to react with the dumb appliances, but only if you, you also have the smart meter to help you. And the third option says that you think you can better react with smart appliances and the smart meter is not that indispensable. And for the fourth option, you need both smart appliances and smart meter to be able to be part, uh, reactive. So let's start voting. Well, I can see that you are acting very quickly. Almost all of you have um, submitted your answers. I'm very happy about that. Thank you very much. So I think um, let's wait a few seconds more to see if there's anybody who still wants to express his view. OK, I see most of you have responded. Let me share the results of the poll with you. OK, as you can see that um, most of you, no, more than half of you uh, opted for option four, which means that you think you need smart appliances and smart meter to participate in an active demand response. Well, I see that also 10% have voted for the first choice and the other um, also voted for the other two options. So let me show you now what says about it. Um, in our research. So um, let's see. So from, the, from our research as well as from the results of the poll, we see that with dumb appliances, it is still possible for consumers to participate in active demand response. It is true that if we only have a dumb washing machine, for example, we can still decide to use it during the off-peak periods instead of the peak hours. So with dumb appliances, consumers can still make a um, deliberate choice to, uh, about the timing of using such appliances. While, of course, the smart appliances would very much facilitate the consumer's reaction with the automation. Also, for the smart meter, it will also be um, of great help to facilitate uh, consumers' responses by providing the more accurate feedbacks on how to program your appliances also about um, it can provide us with more accurate billing information. So here we can see that the consumer's potential to participate in active demand response is not only about the smart appliances, but also about the way we use smart and dumb appliances. So in our report, we have proposed an assessment tool which is to characterize consumers' potential by a load mix. Now let me show you how uh, this tool is conceived. So in the, on the screen, you can see that this big box, let's assume that it contains all the load that a consumer has. First of all, we can categorize this load into the storable and non-storable load. The examples for the storable load can be the heating and cooling systems or electric vehicles that the consumer has. In the non-storable load, we can further uh, distinguish between the shiftable and non-shiftable load. The shiftable loads can refer to the laundry and dishwashers that consumers can decide to use at a later point of time during the day. And again, within the non-shiftable load, we can further distinguish the curtailable and the non-curtailable load. The, the curtailable load can mean this lighting and TV that consumer can decide to stop consuming instantly. While for the, for the last small box, which is non-storable, non-shiftable, and non-cotatable, we refer it to as the base load. It means that the alarm and all the automation systems that needs to be on all the time, or some very important TV shows for certain people, such as a football match. So we can see that and the flexibility is increasing from the base load to the storable load. And altogether, they can form such load mix. 
And it was noting that the same appliances as the TV example that we have just to see right now, for the same appliances, it could enter into different load for different category for different consumers. That is why we think it is more accurate to um, characterize a consumer's potential by such load mix instead of um, of the instead of the appliances. So depending on the dominance of the load type, we can further characterize the consumer's load mix by curtailable mix or shiftable mix or storable mix. So now we have already seen how to assess consumer's potential to participate in demand response. The next step is to see how it interacts with the contract. So here are the five contract types we have identified in our report. The first contract is the best known contract, maybe. It's the time of use contract, which features um, the basic tariff signals for fixed intervals of, um, during the day. And the second contract is the dynamic pricing, which introduces more dynamic signals onto this time of use contract. And then the next two contracts are the so-called volume-based contract. So instead of sending the price signals, it sends the volume signals. So the first volume-based contract is this fixed capping contract, while the dynamic form is the dynamic capping contract. And then lastly, we have this direct load control, which is a control-based contract with automatic operation by a third party. So on the left-hand side, we can see these three load mix that we we have already we have just seen. So let's now look at what is the relationship between them. First, for the curtailable mix, the, we think that curtailable mix can match very well with the dynamic pricing contract and dynamic capping because this kind of uh, load can be curtailed instantly. And um, for the second shiftable mix, it match well with the time of use contract and fixed load capping contract. Um, because consumers need a few times um, to program their um, energy appliances. And then for the storable mix, uh, it can match all the contract types because it is the most flexible mix. So now we have um, seen consumers' potential as well as its interaction with the contract. The next step is to see by the consumers, they are willing to participate, even though they have the potential to do so. Well, conventionally, people might think that consumer, um, they are willing to, um, they only care about the money they receive from the demand response. Well, we think that the financial compensation is a very important aspect when consumer considerate about the participation in demand response, but it is not the only aspect. There are other aspects which are also non-negligible. For example, the social motivation. People may, might participate in demand response if they think they can contribute to a sustainable future. Actually, people are already paying for renewable energies now in their electricity bills. And also, people may have different preferences on risk. So some people, they might be very risk averse, while others, they might, they might risk taking. So they, these people, they may be willing to take risk for more benefits. And also we think people have different perceptions on autonomy and privacy. So some people may consider the autonomy and privacy as the, the most important criteria, which is absolutely non-negotiable, while other, some people may be willing to trade to change a uh, certain privacy for more conveniency. And at last, people also may have different capacity to deal with complexity. So here we see that the consumer's willingness to participate in active demand response depends on their preferences on this a series of criteria. So one consumer can be really different from another. So now I like to know your perception of this criteria, not as an audience of the webinar, but as an electricity consumer. 
So I'd like to launch the second poll now. I hope that you can see it in your, on your screen now. So which contract do you prefer? You can make multiple choice. So the first contract features high price risk, but also you are compensated with high return. And the second option is that you don't like any price risk and also you have very low return out of this contract. The third option is um, you, can, you think you can handle more flexibility as long as you also want um, the full control on your appliances, but you also expect high return out of such contract. While for the fourth option, you you want to have low complexity and you don't also, you don't mind about third party control and, but in the end you are expecting high return. Okay, I see that many of you have already started to vote. Thank you very much. Well, others, well, a few of you are still hesitating. I would like to give a few seconds more to know about your opinion. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will soon reach the majority of you voted. Okay, I think I can close the poll now and share the results with you. Okay, so you can see that, ah, surprisingly, that 42% of you have voted for the last option, which is low complexity, third party control, and high return. Well, only, well, it's not only, so still a considerable share of you have voted for the low price risk with low return. But we can also see that almost all these options has been ticked, while people, uh, um, I don't, they don't really like very much this high price risk with high return. Why well, is understandable. Okay, so, let me show you the results of our research. So we have pre prepared a systematically systematic answer about the relationship between the contract and the preferences. So you can see that on this vertical X, you see um, all the five contract type we have already seen um, in the previous slide. And on the horizontal um, X, there are these five selected criteria that measure consumers' preferences. So if we just start with the time of use contract, we can see that it features a low price risk, very limited because the tariffs has already been decided quite some time ahead. And then there's no volume risk because consumers can still have this unlimited power supply. The complexity is also low, no privacy loss, but in the end, the financial compensation is also limited. However, if the consumer goes from the time of use to the dynamic pricing, he sees immediately that price risk goes high and complexity goes high. But in the end, it can have higher potential for the financial compensation. But then if we go from this price-based contract to the volume-based contract, we see a different picture. So first of all, we see the price risk disappear, but we see um, there are, this contract introduced some volume risk as people now may have a maximum load they can consume for a certain period of time. And then the, it also entails limited autonomy or privacy loss. And, uh, the financial compensation is also limited for the fixed capping contract because it's still a static contract that's sending static signals. Well, the same thing, if we go from the static contract to the dynamic one, we see the volume risk goes high, complexity also increased, and accordingly, the financial compensation is also higher. But then if we go to the direct load control, contract, we see that there's no price risk, no volume risk, very, um, almost no complexity also, and that entails uh, higher autonomy and the privacy loss. But in the end, the financial compensation is also higher. So the main message that this metric transfer is that there's lots of trade-offs 
there's no clear best contract for all consumers. So now if we come back to these questions, can consumers be engaged to participate in activity demand response? The answer is yes, if we provide them enough options and the tools to choose the right contract. So now let's enter into the part two, how to realize active demand response. So how to realize as we said, the first condition is that consumers need enough options. So how to have an adequate range of contracts? And we think this question cannot be answered without looking at the actors who provide this contract, who we call as intermediaries, who intermediate the demand response contract with the consumers. While in other iterations, the intermediaries, they are also called as aggregators. So in our report, we have identified these three categories of intermediaries. The first is the electricity suppliers, the incumbent energy and sector players, while the second is the third party, uh, third parties, which are the actors who do not have vested interest in the energy supply. Well, a third potential uh, type of intermediaries, they can be the consumer cooperatives. They have not yet been emerged, but we think it's a very important actor to be considered in the demand response businesses. Well, by analyzing these different type of intermediaries, we found that there are pros and cons attached to each of them. So for the energy suppliers, it's very, um, the pro is that they have very high expertise in the energy sector as they have so many years of experience in, their, in participating in the energy markets. What the cons is that the demand response activity, it might entail possible conflicts with their core business, which is to sell as much as possible electricity to their clients. Also, um, we see that in many member states, there are still very limited competition pressure in the energy supply domain. While for the third party, the pros is that there's no conflict with their own business. If the third party, such as ESCOs, the energy service companies, or other new players from the telecommunication sectors, for example, if they enter into the demand response business, their um, chief their main concern should be maximize the profit out of um, this business. So we see no conflict with core business, but the downside is that they also lack of expertise to um, play in this quite ex uh, complicated energy markets. While for the consumer cooperative, a very, a very obvious advantage, advantage is that the consumer uh, uh, co cooperatives, they are um, non, non for profit, non, non for profit um, entities, which is composed by aggregation of consumers. So they will have full incentive to share the profit of demand response with consumers. But cons is that the consumers, they also, they may lack expertise on the skills to, to trade in the energy markets. So from this analysis, we can see that one single intermediary, they may not have incentive or competence to provide an adequate range of contracts. But we don't think that we need to correct their business motivation as long as an adequate range of intermediaries coexist. So the question of how to have an adequate range of contract is now turned into how to have an adequate range of intermediaries. And in our report, we provide recommendations on how to ensure an adequate range of intermediaries exist. And these recommendations are mainly focused on facilitating the market entry. So the first recommendation um, is about um, a demand response license. We think the demand res uh, response license is necessary to be able to provide a quality labor to build trust of consumers on the new market players. And second, is a disaggregated billing, and it will allow better comparison of offers from the intermediaries who offer bundled services, for example, the supply and the demand response together, and those who do not. 
Thirdly, there is absolutely need, a need to ensure non-discriminatory access to electricity markets and to data for all market players. And then we know how to achieve an adequate range of contracts by ensuring an adequate range of intermediaries. So next step is for, there is a question for consumers, then how to make choice out of this range. And we see that there is a need for consumer empowerment and protection measures because there are many challenges presenting in the contract selection process. So first of all, the consumers they need to qualify their load mix and during this step they may lack um, knowledge of appliances and they also be, they may lack the skills to use them. And the second step is to recognize their preferences and the consumers they might not be aware of the risks and the rewards implied by the contract and they may also lack the skills to evaluate them. Third, and um, they now they need to select an appropriate contract type out of the five types that we have presented before and here the challenge is that consumers may face the difficulty in aligning load mix and their preferences and finally the consumer needs to find the right contract implementation out of the contract type they have already selected and here one possible barrier is that, is that they may, there may be a lack of comparability in the contract design. So we see that there is a need to empower and cons uh, empower and, uh, protect consumers in making their choice. And we uh, propose a toolkit composed of the following recommendations. First, we see a need of, for the mandatory consumer profiling. We think that such mandatory consumer profiling will, uh, will be necessary to review the consumer's load mix and their preferences. So consumers should not be proposed um, any contract which does not co correspond to their load mix and preferences. Also, we think it, also be, it can also be helpful for the market players, for the intermediaries, to establish a more accurate um, consumer segmentation. And secondly, there is a need for independent contract comparison too. It will facilitate consumers in choosing the appropriate contract and it's also the, it is also the way to ensure the consumers can draw the benefits from the competitive offers. And then we have also other recommendations regarding the range of contracts, the data protection, distribute, uh, dispute resolution mechanism and also vulnerable consumers. But now because of the limited of, um, or the limit of time, I won't go uh, in detail of these recommendations, but you are very um, coordinately invited to have a look at our report, which says more about how this, uh, what is this recommendations is about. So now let's enter into the part three, what is beyond. So we see that the consumer's engagement depending on these two aspects, potential and the willingness. And we also know how to assess this potential by using the load mix and how to know the willingness by um, expressing the preferences. We also know the interaction between consumer engagement um, and the contract terms. And we have already also seen the intermediary's role to provide the consumer with this contract. So what is beyond? It is the market design because the intermediaries, they valorize the demand response they procure from the consumers under specific market design. So before we enter into our discussion uh, about the market design, I would like to launch the third and also the final poll of today's webinar. I would like to know your opinion about whether you think the current retail market design is suitable to accommodate active demand response. Okay. I think you see uh, the poll on your screen now. So is the current retail market design suitable to accommodate active demand response? Here you can make multiple choice. 
of course, if you choose the first one, it means that you couldn't choose the uh, other three, of course. So first of all, you think, um, yes, it is suitable. And the second option is that, no, you don't think it is suitable because the presence of the regulated tariff. And the third reason you vote for no, or another reason you vote for no is that you see there's still unlimited electricity supply as the default contract to consumers. And the last option is that you think no because of the balancing costs are still very largely socialized among consumers. So I'm waiting for you to tell me what is your opinion about the market design. Okay, I see that more than, well, many of you have already voted, while others may still need a few seconds to reflect. The voting goes very quickly. Thank you very much. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds more. I already see very interesting results. Okay. Okay, still somebody is reacting. Okay, I think now I can share with you the results. So you can see that uh, a few, few people think the current retail market design is suitable to accommodate active demand response, while we, you vote no for various reasons. And I see that a large share um, of you have voted for the fourth option um, because of the balancing costs are socialized. I appreciate very much that um, your replies. So because it's is very much in line with what I'm going to show you now. The results of our research. So we have identified that these three weaknesses of the retail, the current retail market, may severely um, in, um, impact the full takeoff of the demand response. So first of all, the regulated tariff. So it, the presence of the regulated tariff is for sure is a very big barrier for demand response because it does not give consumers even uh, not the correct, uh, the real um, cost of electricity. And uh, secondly, the unlimited power supply is also, it can be problematic because under this contract, consumers, they don't have a call on their energy supply. So actually they all pay for the highest reliability, um, no matter how expensive it will be. And the third uh, weakness is the socialized balancing cost. So as long as the balancing costs are socialized, the flexible consumers, they don't see the value of being flexible, while these inflexible consumers don't see the penalty of being um, causing a lot of imbalances to the system. So all this needs to be remedied. So the remedy for the first uh, weakness, the regulated tariff, uh, there's no way other than abolishing the regulated tariff. So we see that in one third of the market, uh, one third of the member states, the regulated tariff has already been abolished, while the other two thirds um, have already submitted their agenda to the European Commission. So we think this is an ongoing progress. While for the second weakness, the unlimited electricity supply, we think there is a need for consumers, for the residential consumers also, to establish a baseline consumption. And third, for the socialized balancing cost, we see there is a need to establish individual imbalance accounts so that people can see the impact as well as the financial um, consequence of the imbalances. And these two will we need a need to a new market design for the retail market. So in our report, we have proposed one such retail uh, market design that accommodates active demand response, which is referred to as a real-time market. In the real-time market, both the supply and demand side will have to express their willingness to sell and buy electricity in real time. And in this case, we see that, that all consumers, they establish a baseline consumption. 
and secondly, also both the cost of, of imbalances and the value of flexibility are made visible to consumers in such real-time market. So it also establishes an individual imbalance accounts, and we consider that with such market, market design, we can anticipate finally a full takeoff of demand response in the long term. So finally, let's wrap up of today's webinar. So first of all, we have investigated the question, how to assess consumers' potential and willingness to participate in active demand response? Our answer is that consumers can be engaged if they have options that reflect their diversity and are adequately empowered to make choices. Secondly, how to realize such active demand response? And in our report, we have proposed a toolkit of consumer empowerment, as well as the measures to facilitate market entry. Thirdly, what is beyond? And we have pointed out the need to redesign the real-time market, which can accommodate active demand response. So that's it. that's it. This is the end of my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. And very, I'm very looking forward to exchange ideas with you during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Sian, for your presentation. I just would like to say before we will start the Q&A that right now on your computer screen, there is the email address of Sian. Um, there were many comments submitted during the webinar, and unfortunately, we won't have time to read all of them. Uh, therefore, I would recommend you to contact Sian directly, and I'm, I'm sure that she, she will reply for your questions um, afterwards. Uh, so let's go to the first questions, and the first question will be, uh, it's basically consisted of two questions together, but all of it, it makes, um, I think that you can make just one uh, reply. So it will be, what if demand response couldn't be provided by the market? Do you think in this case, the DSOs can provide demand response? Okay. Um, thank you very much for this question. It's a very good question. Um, in fact, we have also asked ourselves about this question when we looked into the business models for demand, res uh, demand response. And uh, so, first of all, we think the demand response is still, it should be primarily um, be a market-based activity because it's in, it's, it is about consumer increase and decrease their energy consumption. So it is a commodity-related activity. So following the unbounding principle, it should be a market-based uh, activity. Then there is a um, um, question. So what if the demand response cannot be provided by market players? What, what if the market players, they cannot see a market uh, business model of demand response? Mm -hmm. Well, we think that um, uh, there are two folds. First, um, if the, all the services that could be provided by the demand response um, does not compensate the cost of demand response, then there is no market, uh, no business model for the market player, and this is uh, this is, should be the right result, meaning that demand response should compete also on an equal footing with all other flexibility resources. Well, the other aspect is that it also could be true that we don't see uh, um, uh, the market players, they don't see a market uh, business model related to the deregulated activities, while the DSO or TSO, the regulated actors, they can see a benefit of the regulated activities, such as congestion management or ancillary services. Which they, in which they procure the demand response, uh, mainly for the system reliability reasons. So in that case, we think if the DSO or TSO, they consider that demand response is a very cost-effective way to solve these problems, and um, it must have already passed some cost and benefit analysis. And uh, it means that there is a business model for demand response, and they should um, open a tender, so make such a uh, regulated service, a market-based procurement. And in this way, the market players, they should also see such opportunities released by the regulated um, actors. So we see that um, it's 
this is also one of the recommendation we have given in our report that we calls for a more output regulation for the regulated actors so that the market players they can also see the opportunities of valorizing the demand response in the current regulated activities. I hope that I have answered this question. Okay, thank you. The next question will be, how does your research considers the fact that the timing of peak net, net demand will become less predictable and less seasonal as the share of variable production rises? Uh, with the share of variable? Um, let mm -hmm. me think. Uh, and less seasonal as the share of variable production rises. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I I think um I think maybe we can go back to the first slides when I introduced the context of why this topic. Um as I said before, a very big driver that we um, for 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 us to consider the demand response nowadays is because of this large uh, scale integration of renewable energies which have introduced so much variabilities into the production side. So it is exactly the reason why we think uh, the demand should be uh, should be activated to follow such variations from the production side. It is true that the timing would be becoming more and more unpredictable. So we that is why we see that some of the demand response contract which um, has not been implemented or has not been experienced in on very large scale nowadays could actually accommodate such uh, very short notice variations from the production side. So for example, the dynamic pricing or the dynamic note capping, it, it consists of sending the price or the volume signals to consumer on very short notice exactly to follow the variations of the renewable energy production. So that is why we think that we need to have um, deeper research, also to have more pilot studies on the uh, on the use of such contract to to deal with this uh, challenge of the variabilities from the production side. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the question number three. You mentioned the importance of consumer choices, but it also adds more complexity for consumers. Do you think that consumers could handle this additional complexity? Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, this can be, uh, I think this is the most, one of the most um, frequently asked questions during our research. Well, my, my answer would be that, um, Yes, there is always adding um, additional complexity if we add more options, uh, we give more options to consumers. So I think the real question is that um, what kind of, what is the degree of simplicity that we are looking for? So now we only have one, um, one supply contract, uh, which is uh, by default with unlimited um, power supply or with some very limited uh, time of use signals. So there's one way to avoid complexity with just, which is just to give consumers one option. Well, so we can either go to the simplicity by having only one option or we can have a more uh, constructive or how do you say, more democratic simplicity by having um, more options that correspond to consumers' need, but also we need to simplify the choice making for these consumers. So that is why that in our research we have proposed, we have demonstrated that there's a need of um, an adequate range of consumers so that uh, they can find the offer that corresponds their specificities. But also we have proposed the tools to facilitate consumers in selecting and also in changing the contract. So I think these two ways we should go in parallel, that we should not um, go for simplicity by eliminating consumer's choice, but we should not go to extreme complexity that consumers cannot benefit from the, the competitive offers. 
Okay, thank you. I think that we have time for two more very brief questions. And the first one will be, why not focus on the wholesale market design first? What do you think? Okay. Um, this is a very interesting question. So, first of all, if you have a look at our report, we will see that we have identified all the, um, all the barriers that present in the actual wholesale market design, including these very strict rules for for demand response to participate in the wholesale market, like spot market, it's um, it can be about the very high threshold to uh, to be able to um, propose a bid, or the binding um, requirement about how long the bids can persist in the balancing market. So we have identified there are al already several barriers presenting in the wholesale market design. But we consider that um, this. Um, is uh, relatively easy, or I don't know if I can say that, but these barriers have already been identified and have already been taken into account in many uh, current initiatives. So, for example, we see that demand response is still not allowed to participate in the spot market, and there is also some investigation in France to estimate um, the marginal impact of introducing demand response in the spot market. And uh, we also see some EU-funded projects such as CyberGrid to test a business um, form to introduce demand response in the balancing market. But we see that um, in the long term, in the long term, because demand response is a very decentralized activity, and it's, um, it's, it's actually everybody individually, they participate in the energy trading. So inevitably, there is a need to link the signals we already have in the wholesale market to the demand. Uh, to the demand end, so to the end of uh, to the end consumers. So that is why we think in the long term we see a trend that the wholesale market will be merged more and more with the real time markets, and the consumers will will going to learn more about how the energy market is operated, and they should be an active participants in all the wholesale markets, um, as well as in the real time markets. Okay, thank you very much. And this is the last question, very brief one. How can we measure whether the consumers have responded? Um, yes, this is a very technical and uh, good question. And um, yes, it's true that people might wonder, so how can you know whether a consumer has responded or not responded? Well, well, I would like to also ask a question. So why this question does not present um, for the industrial consumers. It seems that it's very, it does not have any problem to measure the industrial consumers when they provide an, uh, the demand response. So the difference is that the industrial consumers, they have already um, bought the energy um, by forward. So they have already established a baseline for their consumption, which is, can be measured by the contract of, um, by the power that has already been contracted beforehand. So that is why that in our new market design, we see, we see that there is a need in the long term that all consumers, they also need to establish uh, their baseline for the, consum for the energy consumption. They need to state their willingness to pay for energy uh, consumed at all horizons. But uh, let me just say one more thing, that's for the contracts, um, the demand response contracts that I, pre that I have presented today, it does not require um, the measurement of consumers' uh, response because the price-based contract, it sends price signals, so it's up to consumers to decide to react. And also the volume-based contract sends volume signals, while for the control-based contract, Consumers, you don't uh, you don't need to measure them because you actually you turned off the appliances or turned on appliances when you see what is their current state of operation. Okay, I think that's it. 
Thank you very much, Sien, for your presentation, for the Q&A as well. Uh, I would like to say that I'm sure that all of all of us will be thinking about our electricity contract this afternoon and thinking about how so. can we be more active uh, when yeah. we're using the electricity. So thank you very much. Now it's time to say goodbye and I will mute you and turn come back to my computer screen. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.